Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up your countenance upon us, O Lord. Amen. My question today is, how can the biblical book of Psalms help us to draw nearer to God? But first, I have to address what we just heard. What a time. What a time for us to hear Jesus say to us, touch, touch me and see. I have so many friends who have not touched another person for months and months. The vast universe of our experience of spiritual touch, physical touch, has shrunk down to a tiny island where we may only touch one or two people. Never before have I felt so strongly or understood so well the power of a handshake at church or the way that physical touch brings us together. There is a global crisis of intimacy all around us unfolding. And this is the third week of Easter. It's the time when we study the resurrection appearances and are reminded what a mixture of responses all Jesus' friends had when they first saw him after the resurrection. We are standing on the threshold of great changes. And this is a time to wonder at the strangeness of resurrection and of anything that is truly new or alive. But it is also a period when we need to examine the possibility of a deeper intimacy with God. After Jesus' death, he appears in so many ways to so many different people. Um, he appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden and she cannot even recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. He appears to Thomas after he saw of Thomas's friends and Thomas recognizes him through the wounds that he has. And he appears um, to the people who are walking along the road to Emmaus and they don't recognize him and they're taught by him and learn from him until he finally is revealed in the breaking of bread and they rush back to Jerusalem, tell the people what they heard and then all of the disciples who are gathered in that place have this experience that we read about in today's gospel. When the whole group sees Jesus, they feel startled and terrified. They think Jesus is a ghost. And even after he explains to them, after he asks them to touch him, after he shows them the wounds on his hands and his feet, that's still not enough. In the next crucial sentence, Luke explains, in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. My friend Matt Bolton points out that this story vividly describes the way that doubt is naturally a part of faith. He makes the point that when it comes to the resurrection, perhaps the goal is not total certainty about what really happened then or happens in the future, so much as it is a blend of joy, disbelief, and wondering. That this wondering is the true way for us to experience any miracle in our lives. So rather than regarding faith as trying to believe something that is unbelievable, he says that faith means allowing ourselves to be open enough to be astonished. And this morning as we gathered here on a beautiful spring day in San Francisco, I felt the weight of that astonishment that soon we will all be gathered and this empty cathedral will be filled with people who I love. Wonder is what leaves us open to an experience of what God wants for us. It's the experience of humility rather than thinking that we own or possess or know or control God through our sense of certainty. So Matt, my friend, says that the more orthodox approach to faith would be to say with a twinkle in our eyes, I am astounded by the physical resurrection rather than saying sternly with a look of solemnity, I am convinced by the spirit, by the physical resurrection. And this is the difference 
The difference between a living faith, which is a relationship to a person, the person of God, and the idea of faith as a kind of list of beliefs, of things that we need to believe or thoughts that we need to have in order to be right. So if the point of resurrection and the whole Easter season is a new sense of intimacy with God, what practically speaking can we do about that? How can we touch God? The Psalms, those poems and songs that are in the middle of the Bible, they are a powerful way for us to feel God's presence. We hear them so often that sometimes we become kind of deaf to them. But the Psalms offer us a chance to experience God in a far deeper way than we do already. So why do the Psalms matter? For thousands of years, they've been regarded as a kind of new Torah, like the first five books of the Bible that describe the relationship between Israel and God. These are a similar way of describing the relation between a person of faith and God. The Psalms are quoted over a hundred times in the New Testament, referred to in so many different sections. Every New Testament writer, with only two minor exceptions, refers to the Psalms. And so, in fact, if you're listening to a New Testament passage, a story in the New Testament, you're not recognizing that the person is referring to the Psalms. It's really hard to understand the meaning of that passage. When Mary responds to the angel's announcement that she's pregnant, when the soldiers divide Jesus' clothing at his death, when the disciples choose a replacement for Judas, when the religious leaders condemn Jesus as part of a trial, all these are examples of people, figures in the Bible, referring to Psalms to help the reader to understand the depth of meaning. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Jesus on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this is a quotation from the, the book of Psalms. Psalm number 22. In the end of the chapter, in the end of the gospel of Luke, when Jesus is, is crucified there, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And that too is him quoting Psalm 31. So Jesus, his mother, Mary, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, all of them have the Psalms deep in their hearts and use them to express the faith and the experience that they have with God. The Psalms provide a kind of spiritual language that makes it possible for us to navigate the deepest places in our hearts. You may have forgotten what the Psalms are. They're songs that were written for use in the temple. Some people think they were written, some of them were written as long ago as 800 BC. And they were compiled in the, post, uh, in the, in the second temple um, around 516 BC. And the 150 Psalms were divided into five books. And each of the books ends with a kind of doxology, a way of praising God. And it helps us to know that that's the end of that book and that's the next book. So an example of that is Psalm 144, verse 16. It goes like this. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen, I say. Amen. All of the Psalms are driving to the last five two Psalm, the last five Psalms. The last five Psalms all end with the same word, hallelujah. Hallelu is the command to rejoice, the command to um, praise, and jah, jah is short for Yahweh. Hallelujah is, re, is the rejoice in God. The first Psalm is about how we should take delight in God, that the, those who study the law are blessed. The second psalm refers to the messianic king who's going to make things right in the future. There are so many treasures in the psalms, I almost don't know where to begin with them. Psalm 51 is the psalm that we use in the very beginning of Lent. It's a, a psalm of repentance. It's what we do and what we feel when we've done something terribly wrong and we want to change our path to get closer to God again. 
Psalm 104 is one of my favorite psalms in the whole Bible. It's another creation story about how God brings into being all things that are beautiful in the world. And Psalm number 119 is an alphabet psalm. It's arranged by the alphabetical letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so the first groups of, the first lines are Aleph, the second group of lines are Beit, and it's all the way through the entire alphabet, a description of how beautiful it is to study the law of the Lord. Psalms are a form of poetry. In English, we use rhymes in many poems. And in Hebrew poetry, they use symmetry or what they call parallelism. They say the same thing again in a different way to add emphasis to something, to help us to see around the edges of it. It's like a three-dimensional way of seeing. For instance, Psalm 27 verse 1 goes like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I, be, who, whom shall I fear? That's the first part. And then it echoes it again. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Perhaps the most important thing, though, for you to remember about the Psalms today is that they fall roughly into two different categories. There are Psalms of lament and Psalms of praise. Psalms of lament are those Psalms that come from places of pain and suffering and confusion Anger, misery, that's that deep part of us. Psalm 23 calls it the valley of the shadow of death. The part that sees injustice un, un, unreconciled in the world. It's the cry for God to help make things right. Psalms of praise, just in the way that the Psalms of lamentation are about the social world and the way we treat and mistreat each other. So many of the Psalms of praise are about the natural world, about the greater good, the beautiful things that God is making from the whales and the hippopotamus to the small birds to the shapes of the hills. They are a reminder that no matter how things go awry, no matter how things go wrong, that God is at the center of all things and that God is drawing the world closer in love. One of my favorite lessons in the Bible is the way that Psalms is structured as a book. So in the beginning, Psalms of lamentation, Psalms of lamentation predominate. And then as the book goes along, we read more and more psalms of praise. For me, what this means is just in the same way that when you first hear about what God wants for humanity, what God wants for the world, and you look and you see the terrible injustice in the streets of this country and the world, when you see the horrible suffering, you cannot help but have your heart um, be moved by that. But, Christianity, faith, is always looking forward. It's always a reminder to give thanks that this is our time, that this life of ours is a gift. And psalms of praise bring us back to that truth. So on the one hand, with our whole selves, we, we bring our whole selves to God. The suffering parts, the angry parts, the miserable parts, and God gives us a chance to see the world again through our thanksgiving. So today I'm asking you to do something very simple. I'm asking you to do what Mary and Jesus and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Peter and Paul all do. I'm asking you to commit part of the Psalms to memory. Memorize Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Or memorize Psalm 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Or memorize Psalm 104 or 51 or any of these psalms. But commit yourself in the mornings to repeating these lines and learning them and putting them into your heart. And you'll find that throughout the day, they bubble up in your consciousness and help you to see how God is at work healing and loving the world. We are joyful, disbelieving, 
but still wondering. We stand at the threshold, taking in the strangeness of what is truly new and alive as people who are astounded by the resurrection. As you return to the world of touch, there will be joys and there will be struggles. But all of this will be made better by a more conscious connection to God. Listen. In the deepest reaches of your being, hear God's invitation. God says to us, touch me and see.